The Siege of Vrax. In any other sci-fi or fantasy universe, the battle for Vrax would be the catastrophe the heroes are fighting to avoid. The battle itself would be the apocalyptic ending of the story in meaningless bloodshed and horror, where our heroes are reduced to nothing more than meat with which to feed the furnace of endless slaughter. In any other universe, the city undergoing a horrible siege and facing insurmountable odds might be compared with the plight of Gondor, or the fall of Orsgard during the Ragnarok. The defenders are facing an enemy that possesses a complete disregard for their own lives. An enemy that simply hurls themselves against the walls again and again until their very bodies create a ramp upon which to climb. The city's populace face an enemy that seek to eradicate every man, woman, and child within the walls, even at the cost of their own lives. In any other universe, the city's defenders would be the heroes. And this would be their last stand, their final hour, their apocalypse. In 40k, this is reality. This is day to day because you see not only is this not the end this is the norm this is the day-to-day -day existence for millions for 17 years and the good guys they're the ones trying to break in to the city so are we hyped are we excited we are finally here now the siege of vrax I've been teasing this one for quite a while, but one last little thing before we get started. I would like to once again just thank everybody who's been watching my channel for the last few years, and my patrons in particular. This video series simply would not be possible without all of you guys, so once again, thank you all so much. And now, without further ado, let's get into the Siege of Vrax. The Battle for Vrax was to prove one of the bloodiest single-planet campaigns ever fought by the Death Corps of Krieg, and considering their own bloody civil war almost wiped their planet off the face of the galaxy, that's saying something. And yet, this monstrous campaign of slow, grinding, meticulous, painful attrition and bloodshed that was to last for 17 years and claim the lives of tens of millions of loyalists and traitors alike was all started with the death of one single frail old man. Though, to be certain, it was well and truly his time. The man was Cardinal Astral Borgia, and he had lived until the ripe old age of 400 years. Uh, though perhaps saying he had lived until that age might be an overly optimistic interpretation. His body, more so than the man, had been kept alive well beyond the limits of human endurance, by the technology of the Adeptus Mechanicus. The Cardinal had not left his palace for 200 years, and his bed for well over half of that time. At the end, his spiritless husk was kept alive by constant blood transfusions and barely understood machinery. Nevertheless, his passing was mourned by billions across the subsector, and was also the starting shot for the ensuing power struggle to fill the vacuum left behind by his death. The man who would eventually rise to fill that power vacuum was a comparatively young man by the name of Zaphon, a favoured student of the old Cardinal. Upon his elevation to the rank of Cardinal, he declared he would go on a pilgrimage of the areas now under his spiritual rule, for he had never before seen the places or the billions he must now guide. The pilgrimage would take a full five years, stopping by the various imperial shrines of importance in the subsector. Along with him travelled what was, by Adeptus Ministorum leadership standards, a humble entourage of some 1,000 souls. Mostly preachers, deacons, servants, and the likes, including a personal bodyguard of Adeptus Sororitas, the feared and ever faithful Sisters of Battle. His entourage, however, quickly grew far beyond the starting 1000, as various groups, cults more like, attached themselves to it. They loudly proclaimed that the Cardinal's pilgrimage was a holy crusade, 
figuratively rather than violently, at the moment at least, to rid the sector of heresy, purge, and to judge the impure, and bring salvation to the faithful. It's important to understand just what a big deal this was. In many of the places the Cardinal visited, his arrival and the subsequent speeches made drew crowds of hundreds of thousands, occasionally millions of people, often to improvised venues never intended to hold anything like those numbers. It was far from unusual for large-scale riots to break out as people fought just to get a glimpse of the new Cardinal. This often necessitated a rather harsh response from the Cardinal's bodyguards in order to keep him safe. Suffice to say, the Sisters of Battle fired their bolters on full auto into more than one crowd of people. You can imagine the effect of that, a dozen or so fully automatic grenade launchers firing into a throng of human beings. I don't know about salvation, but the Cardinal certainly brought judgement to quite a few people. His uh, pilgrimage was causing a fair bit of trouble around the subsector, but what about Zaphon himself? How did he feel about all of this? Perhaps he was repulsed by the violence done in his name. Perhaps he had never thought his pilgrimage would come to this. You could even say that he had never asked for this. Except, of course, he had. Zaphon was far too driven and experienced a man of the cloth not to know the effect his mere presence could have on the people of the Imperium. And now that many were calling him a messiah, the true herald of the Emperor himself, there could be no doubt. His pilgrimage was not only just and correct, it was necessary. Back on the Cardinal world, he would have wasted hours debating every minutia with his council. Little, if any, of the Emperor's true work would be done, but out here? Out amongst the masses, here his words held real weight. With but a whisper he could raise armies, with his shouted voice he could topple planetary governors. Here, amongst the true faithful, not the make-believe believers of the Cardinal world, he could create miracles. And why shouldn't he? He was a just man, a pious man, chosen by the Emperor, it was clear for all to see. Even his closest advisers encouraged his actions, though they also provided him with warning. There might be those out there with narrower minds than his own, men who in their deplorable ignorance might mistake his glory's purpose for such base emotions as lust for power, ridiculous as that may of course be. Nevertheless, it pays to be prepared, and Zaphon now envisioning a glorious war of faith to sweep the whole sector clean of heresy could not risk the interference of some close-minded inquisitor. How to prepare, though? Due to ancient edicts, the Adeptus Ministorum was banned from maintaining any men under arms, therefore precluding, of course, the keeping of a standing army. The Sisters of Battles were themselves a clever circumvention of that very edict, but their numbers were limited, and the Inquisition's resources were anything but. And it stood to reason, Saphon's trusted advisers told him, that the Inquisition had already infiltrated his faithful hordes. There were always weak-willed individuals to be exploited by the nefarious agents of the Inquisition, and clear as day as Saphon's holy mission might be, there were always someone who were too blind to see. After all, had not the Emperor himself once been betrayed? The Cardinal's ambitions were too grand, he would have to take some precautions, and ably helped along by his most faithful adviser, Deacon Mamoon, he set about the creation of an inner circle. A group of faithful, fully vetted and appropriately surveilled at all times, at least any waver in their faith, followers. And then of course, this group, along with the Cardinal, would need a new home. The Cardinal world was not fitting for his grand ambitions. He needed somewhere secluded, somewhere out of the way, so as not draw unwanted attention, but simultaneously close enough to be forever within reach of the primary worlds of the subsector and, of course, the Cardinal's own spies. Nay, not spies, 
but those who are of pure faith and whose presence would in turn ensure the continued faithfulness of their charges. Luckily, there was just such a place within easy reach, the world of Vrax. It was home to the massive basilica of Saint Leonis the Blind, martyred in the 38th millennia. The Cardinal would take up residence in the adjoining palaces to take a moment of respite and to organise the rest of his pilgrimage. Nothing could be more natural, he had been on the road for years and it was about time for a quick little breather. And best of all, the world was an Adeptus Administratum world under the auspices of the Munitorum. The Administratum had always been a dreadfully close-minded and suspicious organisation as far as the Adeptus Ministorum was concerned, and Zaphon found considerable delight in making his plans right underneath their very noses. To further enhance the subterfuge, he made all the proper arrangements. Vrax was after all an armoury world, used to store the vast quantities of military material used by the Imperial Guard across the sector. To protect these stores, Vrax had also become a fortress world who had withstood several attempts to assault and besiege it in its long history. As such, it was quite obviously a sensitive world, and travel to and from Vrax was highly restricted. But the Cardinal had friends in all the right places. Besides, his position quite literally meant he owned the Basilica and all the attached structures. Even if the Administratum wanted to prevent him to travel to Vrax, there would hardly be any sufficient reason to stop him or to deny the Cardinal's requests. Nevertheless, it greatly amused the Cardinal to undergo all the proper steps, even insisting on the vetting process, to make sure that everything was above board. Every successful test cleared boosted his self-confidence, and in his eyes, he was outsmarting the dull-witted drones of the Administratum at every turn. And finally, after all the formalities, all the procedures, and all of the checks, his arrival was greeted with grand celebration, all the pomp and ceremony that Vrax could muster. Along with the Cardinal came thousands of staffs and tens of thousands of various followers, including within them considerable groupings of armed followers, essentially militia-like groups that had formed around the Cardinal and his ever more... Um, confrontational, shall we say, rhetoric. The Cardinal made his pilgrimage to the Basilica and then withdrew to his private palaces, where he remained unavailable for further audiences due to his ongoing spiritual contemplations. The nature of these contemplations, however, were far more material than spiritual. The Cardinal was preparing for his great war of faith, but to wage a war one must necessarily have an army, and the Ministorum was of course banned from such things, but fortuitously, like with all things, there was a loophole. The Basilica of St. Leonis on Vrax was entitled to raise a Frateris militia in times of need to protect itself. As the name suggests, the Frateris militia is a group of armed individuals that form a sort of army, in a way, under the temporary command of the Adeptus Ministorum, and this can circumvent the edict barring them from having any men under arms, since the Frateris militia can be made up of anyone and everyone. It also harkens back to back in the day before the Age of Apostasy, before the decree that banned the Ministorum from having an army. Back then, the military arm of the Ministorum was known as the Frateris Templars, and the Frateris Militia is but the palest shadow of the once incredible military might of the Church of the God Emperor. But one, of course, has to start somewhere, and a militia, whilst not necessarily an army in and of itself, was certainly a start, and there was no actual limitation or restrictions upon the size or composition of the Frateris Militia that the Basilica might raise in times of need.
The only problem was with the end of that sentence. Times of need. Uh, there was currently no need. Not on Vrax, nor in the solar system, nor even in the subsector as a whole. It was all remarkably quiet and stable. For a change in 40k, the closest war zone was many, many warp months away, so the Cardinal would have a somewhat hard time making it out as if some imminent threat was about to descend upon Vrax, but such a small thing as the truth should never be enough to stop men of real talent and foresight. What is, after all, one small innocent lie today measured against the gains of tomorrow? And so the Cardinal's deacons and priests walked amongst the people and labourers of Rux, telling them of a great impending threat. Already, planets on the periphery of the system were falling to a tide of heretical monstrosities. Time was short indeed, and they had to take up arms swiftly in just crusade to safeguard their holy world. Soon, thousands had joined the Frateris militia, and many more joined the Cardinal's various other armed groups of followers. And speaking of followers, Deacon Mamoon had persuaded the Cardinal to establish a true inner circle. A inner circle within the inner circle, because, of course, this one would be made up of only his most ardent and zealous followers. Rather than being made up of officials and priests, it would primarily contain the leaders of the various armed groups that had sworn themselves to the Cardinal. They would also begin the formation of a trusted body of loyal men under arms, known as the Disciples of Zaphon, in clear violation of the Edict. Members of Vrax's ruling elite were also introduced into the fringes of this inner circle, though mostly by promises of monetary compensation and power rather than faith. Those who could not be enticed were swiftly removed or accidented out of the way, and replaced by those who could. And within a frighteningly short span of time, Zaphon had essentially established full control over Vrax's military as well as administration. This also seems an opportune time to point out that a considerable portion of Vrax's population were essentially slaves. Mostly convicts placed in a heavy guard and chained together, forced to work in vast quarries breaking rock and working on the ever-expanding fortifications on Vrax. The Cardinal's preachers begun walking amongst these wretched souls and promising them salvation, a way out, a redemption for their crimes, or at the very least improved living conditions for the moment. If they were to join the Frateris Militia, their day-to-day -day chores would be lessened, and they might even be given extra rations to make life, although not exactly comfortable, at the very least somewhat more bearable. Now, of course, as a part of the Frateris Militia, even though it was currently quote-unquote mobilizing in times of need, this wasn't really a standing militia. Obviously, handing out weapons to a slave population is never a particularly good idea. They were given the absolute bare minimum in the way of military training and told to exercise with wooden replicas of auto guns. And as for shooting training, <laughs> well, <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah. It didn't happen much, let's just say. But nevertheless, the Frateris militia on Vrax was growing exponentially and far beyond the remits of the treaty, considering there were absolutely nothing in the way of any actual threat anywhere nearby. And this rather swiftly got the attention of a certain Imperial organization. Despite the Cardinal's misgivings, he had for the most part been flying underneath the radar so far. But the invoking of the Defense Treaty of the Basilica of St. Leonis, that had caught the attention of the Ordo Hereticus, the least tolerant of all the Inquisitorial Orders, and that is saying something. That makes them by far the blackest of all of the kettles in the cupboard.
and they were particularly famed for their somewhat extreme solutions to various problems. In this case, this was a problem they had seen all too often before. A sheltered cardinal gets a glimpse of the real world, he escapes however momentarily from his gilded cage, and suddenly he starts getting ideas, delusions of grandeur, and thinks that he can change the world. And oddly enough, said ideas of worldly revolution almost always involves vast quantities of weapons and men trained to use them. You would think that at least one of these cardinals would simply decide to open a chain of soup kitchens or something, but no, armed insurrection it usually is. Granted, the cardinal hadn't technically made himself guilty of this... yet. But he was clearly heading in that general direction, and the Ordo Hereticus is not an organisation overly fond of taking chances, nor are they particularly famed for betting on the better nature of mankind. And so, orders were issued to ensure that Cardinal Zaphon would never make the ultimate mistake, and they would ensure this by cutting his reign somewhat short. The irony of it all is of course that, up until this point, the Inquisition hadn't really paid too much attention to the Cardinal. It was only when he began taking countermeasures directly against them that they started paying a particular interest in his activities. For after all, the Inquisition is the most forgiving and trusting of organisations, but if you're going to try to keep secrets from them, well... You'd better be really, really good at it, because the Inquisition, ironically enough, considering their own field of expertise, are not particularly fond of secrets. The choice of assassin eventually fell upon the Vindicar Temple. This is an organisation of the Officio Assassinorum that specialises in long-range sniping execution, utilising handcrafted and highly specialised Exodus long rifles. A Vindicar assassin armed with this marvellous piece of military technology, and with a wide variety of highly specialised ammunition at his disposal, is more than able to put an execution around through a target's head at several kilometres range. Now, a long-range sniping execution might not seem like the most subtle way of taking care of a cardinal, and that was entirely intentional. The Officio Assassinorum has, within its organisation, several temples that specialise in different ways of assassination. They could have sent an expert in poisons to try and make his death look like a heart attack, for example. Or they could have sent an info site to try and manufacture some event where the Cardinal would have an accidental death. Perhaps an elevator would malfunction and drop him to his death, perhaps. Or they could send someone considerably more direct. Like a raged, infused, monstrous killer that would rampage through the Basilica until he eventually reached the Cardinal's chamber. But all of this was, of course, carefully considered. An accidental death would not send the right message. A accidental yet suspicious death again, lacked in punch, shall we say, but a mad rage killer butchering his way through a holy place of the Imperium uh, was a little bit too blatant. Instead, they needed a way of assassinating him that on one hand could be denied, plausibly so, I mean, any realistic estimate of the assassination would quite clearly show that this could only have been carried out by an extraordinarily skilled individual, which somewhat shortens the list, shall we say, but nevertheless, that in and of itself is not evidence, and it also had to be blatant enough to send a clear and loud message, don't get on the Inquisition's radar, or you too might meet an untimely end. But before aforementioned abrupt ending to the Cardinal's worldly duties could be carried out, the Ordo Hereticus' chosen assassin first had to infiltrate Vrax. Now, obviously, he had no problems with the security clearance because, well, Inquisition. 
but that still left a fair few hurdles for him to pass before getting within range of the Cardinal. Luckily, due to being a Vindicari, he didn't have to get all that close, and so he infiltrated the Basilica itself dressed like a pilgrim. During the night of his arrival, he climbed to the top of the highest tower of the Basilica, couched his Exodus long rifle, and made himself as comfortable as he was likely to get, considering he was squatting at the top of a cathedral spire. And with that done, all that remained was to wait for an opportunity. It was going to take several long days of careful observation and waiting, but as the Vindicar assassin knew all too well, if you wait long enough, the opportune moment will eventually arrive. And just as always, it eventually did. A single rocket-assisted hypervelocity adamantine jacketed round began its long, yet brief and fiery journey towards its new home, Zaphon's chest cavity. The shot was far from ideal, the Cardinal was a paranoid man and not without reason. He took great pains to ensure he never walked in any open spaces where, say, a sniper might, for example, get a good shot at him. There was, however, a split moment when he passed through an ornamental archway which provided a straight line from the Vindicari's gun and the Cardinal's heart. Unfortunately, said straight line sent the bullet through a meter-thick ornamental pillar. Not itself a problem for a turbo penetrator round who sliced through marble decorations like butter, but it prevented the assassin from firing a shield break around. It was a calculated risk, a reasonable one as well. Personal shield technology is extraordinarily rare and usually well out of the reach for even a cardinal. Unfortunately, Zaphon had proved himself to be something quite out of the ordinary for a cardinal, and for a split instant his Rosarius shield generator leapt into violent, sparking life, materializing a gossamer-thin layer of impenetrable shield energy between the cardinal and the bullet. The shield generator robbed the projectile of almost all of its energy, but nevertheless, it cracked several of the Cardinal's ribs and sent him sprawling to the ground. But by the time a second and a third round left the assassin's weapon, the Cardinal's bodyguards had interposed themselves. The split-second opportunity had come, and it had gone. Oh dear. Well. This leaves our would-be assassin in a bit of a pinch. He finds himself on the top of a basilica spire, a basilica, by the way, that is filled to the absolute brim with religious maniacs, in a city filled to the absolute brim with yet more religious zealots, and of course the city itself is surrounded by miles upon miles of bunkers, trenches, minefields, barbed wire, and not to mention, a few thousand soldiers. All of which was entirely irrelevant, of course. The Officio Assassinorum does not train its operatives to give up. The Vindicari began his long journey down, and hopefully to some form of escape, where he could have another attempt at Zaphon. Unfortunately, there were a lot of people within the Basilica, unsurprisingly, and it didn't last long before the Vindicari was discovered. And without his pilgrim disguise, it was rather obvious that he didn't belong there. The staff of the Basilica tried to stop him and find out who the fuck he was. Of course, they had no idea of the assassination attempt as of yet, but unfortunately for them, the Vindicari did not have the time to be stopped, and so simply shot anyone that tried to attempt him from leaving. This quickly escalated into a full-on gun battle with the Basilica's guard, which slowed the assassin down enough for the disciples of Zaphon to arrive in force, having located the only possible area that the bullet could have come from. 
And with the Basilica now swarming with surprisingly well-equipped disciples, there was no escape out for the Vindicari. He had one final desperate gamble, and that was to go underneath the Basilica, deep into the catacombs, hoping against hope that there would be some form of escape path that he hadn't previously been able to identify. Unfortunately for the Officio Assassinorum agent, the Inquisition had been as effective as they always were. They had identified all of the potential escape routes, and none of them were in the Basilica's catacombs. The realization that there was no way out led to a last gunfight between the Assassin and the Disciples of Zaphon, which ended with the Assassin placing his last two rounds in a pair of Disciple craniums, before two dozens of their bullets found the Assassin. The Vindicari's mangled and abused corpse was shortly thereafter paraded through the streets of the city for all to see, as evidence that the enemy had finally arrived. The insidious taint of which the preachers had so vehemently spoken was now clear for all to see, and not only that, but it had struck directly at their very messiah. As you can probably imagine, things were about to get a lot worse. And it all started with the now Frateris Militia, made up of course again partially of various workforces on Vrax, but also enrolled in the Frateris Militia were huge numbers of essentially armed gangs and cults that had been following the Cardinal for quite some time now, and had arrived on the planet either with him or shortly thereafter. And as far as they were concerned, Somebody had just taken a shot at their messiah. In other words, this was a clear sign of an invasion. The very invasion they had been warned against for so long, and if the enemy was not only finally upon them, but amongst them in this very moment, they needed weapons. Real weapons. They were already mostly armed, but they'd simply brought with them whatever they could from their home worlds. We're talking simple civilian issue solid slug weapons like rifles or pistols, maybe one or two automatic pieces here and there, but for the most part they were either very basic solid shot weapons, or very simple melee weapons, uh, clubs, improvised spears, and the occasional sword or maybe a hand axe nothing to fight an invading army with. However, they were currently sitting on an armory world. An armory world with enough vehicles, weapons, ammunition, and general equipment to outfit ten armies. And the only thing standing between them and all of those goodies were a handful of PDF forces, many of which were already and the cardinal service. Hmm. Doesn't take a genius to see what happened next, does it? And indeed, in many cases, the PDF garrison forces guarding some of the storage areas were simply ordered to stand aside and allow the militia to pillage their bunkers to their heart's content. Local Arbites forces were going to prove less cooperative. The Arbites had deployed immediately after they received news of the assassination attempt, as the zealots were starting to run rampant in the streets, with all the usual complications of death and destruction that is brought about by tens of thousands of crazies venting their frustration, and initially the Arbites had some success in dealing with the rioters, mostly due to the straight out of the gate heavy handed approach of the local Arbites. This was a world with a considerable slave population, as such they were not exactly strangers to, um, problems, shall we say, on a civilian level, and the Arbites deployed right out of the gate with specially equipped riot rhinos and Arbites suppression squads armed with shotguns. They were making short work of the unruly semi-civilian population until they found themselves facing last guns, APCs, and tanks. Granted, Arbites forces on most worlds, and even more so in a world like Vrax, are essentially paramilitary organizations in and of themselves, but this was more than they were used to. They requested support from the Planetary Defense Force, but 
Rather unsurprisingly for anyone who's been paying attention, those who requests were usually not answered. The Arbites began retreating back to their precinct fortress house, a mini fortress inside a fortress, complete with pillboxes, heavy machine gun emplacements, barbed wire, minefields, anti-tank glass and rocket weaponries, etc, etc. Behind their precinct walls they fought to the last bullet and the last Arbite, still holding out hope that maybe, just maybe, other forces would eventually arrive to assist them. They held out in this manner for several weeks against practically the entire population of the planet. But at the end they simply ran out of ammunition, and with nothing to hold the zealous hordes back, the massive armoured doors were eventually beaten down and the remaining Arbites torn to pieces, and subsequently paraded through the streets as victory trophies. And when the uh, quote unquote civilian population is carrying the mutilated corpses of law enforcement through the streets, it is reasonable to assume that things have gotten somewhat out of hand. And the Cardinal knew this as well. It was becoming increasingly clear to Zaphon that it was now or never. His preachers walked amongst the chain gangs and labour mobs encouraging them to break their chains. The enemy was upon them and they should join their brothers in the Frateris Militia, loot the armories and secure the planet. And many did. All over the city, first a few uprisings, then when those were successful due to the hesitant nature of the official response, many more picked up their shovels and pickaxes and used them to break their own chains. Then put them to far bloodier work, dispatching their ex-guards. Now of course, Vrax being in part a massive prison colony, this was far from the first time the ungrateful prisoners had a go at breaking their chains. There were protocols in place to deal with just such an event, and normally the Arbites would be more than enough to deal with any such uprising. In this case, well, they had their hands full. If the Arbites were not successful, then the PDF and the Imperial Garrison would be sent in, and that should be enough to subdue pretty much any uprising. But that of course assumes that the PDF and Imperial Garrison will actually obey the instructions issued to subdue the rebellion. In this case though, considerable portions of the PDF and the garrison itself was already well and truly in Zaphon's pocket. And so the elements that did immobilize found themselves in the best case scenario, unsupported and facing vast hordes of armed prisoners, and in the worst case scenario, under direct fire from their supporting units. And what about the Sisters of Battle? You might be wondering where the hell are the Adeptus Sororitas while the entirety of Rax is tearing itself apart? Well, the Prioress of the Order of the Argent Shroud, the senior Battle Sister attached to the Cardinal, demanded an audience with him to ask precisely that same question. Why had her sisters not been mobilized to aid the garrison forces? At the very least, they should be sent to relieve the Arbites currently under siege in their precinct house. And she was indeed granted her audience only to be immediately thrown into a prison cell when she showed up for it. The disciples of Zaphon then stormed the priory where the remaining Adeptus Sororitas were housed and placed them all under arrest. Some fought back, but surprised, unequipped, and totally unprepared as they were, they were unable to mount any meaningful resistance. With this latest influx of new prisoners, the cells quickly filled up under the Cardinal's new regime. Fortuitously, the Cardinal already had a solution to this problem at the ready, namely just simply letting all of the old prisoners go, providing of course they joined the Frateris Militia, to show they had um, reformed themselves, obviously. And with the incarcerations of the sisters, the last real barrier to the Cardinal's power had been removed. At the end of several days of rampant rioting, he found himself in essentially complete and utter control of Vrax. Those who had previously remained um, uncooperative did not survive the rioting. This, as mentioned, left the Cardinal in complete control of Vrax. Its vast armories, its defences, its populace, its labour calls, everything. 
And whilst that might sound like a very good deal, and indeed it was, he had carried out an extraordinarily successful coup, and he had been given justification, at least as far as the population was concerned, to carry it out. It had been, in many ways, the perfect way to do it. The population was now on his side, the ruling elite were on his side, and anyone that wasn't... Well, as I mentioned, those didn't survive the riots. However, there was one teensy-weensy problem. The Cardinal was under absolutely no illusions about who had tried to kill him, and he also knew that no matter how clean the rebellion on Vrax might have been, at least from an internal standpoint, it would never be good enough for the Inquisition. As far as they were concerned, he had now seized power over an Imperial world through force. Not an action the Inquisition tend to look upon particularly favourably. And even if, for some mysterious reason, they were so inclined, something roughly as likely as a herd of flying pigs deciding to clean your windows one evening, the Cardinal again knew who had taken a shot at him, and the Cardinal wasn't exactly the forgiving sort either. But in all due reality, all of that is more or less besides the point. The Cardinal was now painfully aware, quite literally through several broken ribs at this point, that he was on an inquisitorial hit list. His only real chance at this point was to seize control of Vrax and raise the flag of independence, at the very least temporarily. It is unclear whether or not the Cardinal was intending to go full-on rogue, or if he had some other motives. Uh, we do know that he hadn't gone heretical just yet, at the very least. He still considered himself a faithful servant of the Emperor, and merely a misunderstood individual. And so, probably his best bet would be to try and feign ignorance, perhaps. See if he could find some diplomatic way out of this, or possibly even try to leverage the vast quantities of arms and supplies stockpiled on Vrax in some form of trade. There was, however, one small problem. As you can probably imagine, large-scale rebellions are not the most subtle or, indeed, precise of tools. And whilst the civilians and the Fraternity's militia were running rampant in the streets, they also broke into the planet's primary administratum complex. Now, on one hand, this was obviously a bastion of resistance against the Cardinal's budding rule, as it would be filled to the absolute brim with various administratum officials, or drones, as the Cardinal would probably like to call them. Of course, these were natural enemies of the new regime, and were slaughtered as was only right and proper, but the complex also housed the planet's complement of astropath psychers, Vrax's one and only true way of communicating with the wider Imperium, and the rebels chose to slaughter every single last one of them as well. On the bright side, this obviously prevented the remaining loyalists on the planet from calling for help. But, to be fair, there weren't that many loyalists left. And on the not-so-bright side, it also completely isolated Vrax and prevented the Cardinal as well from talking to the wider Imperium, which meant that the only version of the story the Imperium would be hearing was the Inquisition's side of the story. At this point, there might still have been some way for the Cardinal to try and get out of his predicament if he could reassure the Imperium that he had not wished to take power. He could even perhaps use the vast quantities of weapons and equipment on the planet as a form of bargaining chip to strike some sort of deal for protection against the Inquisition in return for perhaps going back to his cardinal world and staying there. Instead, now, the first thing he would know about the Imperium's response would be when it arrived on Vrax. The only question then was, what form would that response take? A question I am sure both you and the Cardinal are very keen to know the answer to, but you're gonna have to wait for that for a while longer, as this is the end of the first episode of The Siege of Vrax.
If you enjoyed it, please do consider sharing it around to anyone who might be interested. And finally, a thank you to all of my patrons who made this video series possible in the first place. Until next time, I have been Arch, thank you all very much so for watching, and I hope to see you all again soon. Have a good day.